out ways to help people that are free and easy to do and easy to implement. Um, and that's where my wheels started turning and thinking about what ways we can train, what approaches we can take to life and to work that can optimize the human being biologically, but it's something that everyone can do and adopt. Hi, everybody. I'm Jamie Derringer. I'm Amy Devers, and this is Clever. And today we're hearing from Dr. Sahar Youssef. She's a cognitive neuroscientist at UC Berkeley. And yeah, she's a doctor, not our usual creative story. But when I was invited to speak with Dr. Youssef in person at the Adobe 99U conference, I jumped at the chance. Her consulting practice is dedicated to helping leaders and businesses improve their performance by becoming more focused and productive. She spent her life's work studying how to take care of your brain and accelerate your creativity. So yeah, we knew you'd want to hear what she has to say. Just a quick audio note that Amy sat down with Sahar during the 99U conference, so you'll hear some exciting conference sounds in the background. Let's listen in on their chat. My name is Sahar Youssef. I live in the San Francisco Bay Area, born and raised, a part of a dying breed. I'm a cognitive neuroscientist and a faculty lecturer at the Haas School of Business at UC Berkeley. And I consult on how to help leaders, their teams, and their organizations be more productive and peak performing based on principles of neuroscience and physiology. Whoa. That's a lot of space in your brain that, you're <laughs> that you've are that got occupied. Not at Let's all. go all the way back to zero. Can you tell us a little bit about growing up in the Bay Area and what kind of kid you were and what sparked your interest in neuroscience and what got mm -hmm. you on this path? Oh, boy, sure. Yeah, only child. So the kind of kid you don't do twice. <laughs> <laughs> I grew up um, actually in the East Bay my entire life. I'm a child of Iranian immigrants post-revolution, part of that fun crowd. And I grew up happy kid, curious kid, nerdy kid, as you might imagine, always super fascinated uh, by the human brain and consciousness specifically. So I actually started out in philosophy. Oh, I was going to ask you about consciousness yeah. because... My first love. Great. Yeah. Well, let's get into that. But first, I want to talk a little bit about... You were a nerdy kid. Were you studious? Were you, was academics stressed? Or is it this fascination with the brain and consciousness that pulled you all the way through the PhD program? I started out actually very, very studious, but um, I actually, uh, I was asked to leave my high school. <laughs> I had a really great time as a, as a young girl, <laughs> pretty early in life, I would say. My curiosity, let's just say, is expansive. <laughs> yeah. Okay, so the wink that you're giving me with your face is really <laughs> tempting me to ask you a lot more questions about that, but we do have a short time with you today, so I'm going to have to... Conversation for another day. <laughs> okay, but the point is you got kicked out of high school and you still ended up with a PhD. Yes, so... and it's, it's about if you follow your heart and your curiosity, mm -hmm. always. Curiosity first. Um, I think you end up where you're supposed to end up and you, you end up doing, thankfully what you love doing and what you're meant to do with your life. Um, and for me, it was kind of following my nose and my heart and my mind to study the one thing that I believed is the only thing that actually exists in the world, and that's human consciousness. Really thinking about your entire reality in life, in the entire world, objective reality. Nothing really exists outside of our minds. Starting out trying to understand where human thought comes from, mm -hmm. feelings of love, belief, fear, all of it, every part of the human experience, even what we experience, again, of objective reality, is from the rose-colored glasses of our human consciousness. So I wanted to start off there to really say, if I only figure out one thing in my entire life before I die, that's all I have, that's all I know, and that's all I would love to study. We started there, um, and I ended up in cognitive neuroscience because you hit kind of a wall in philosophy where you're trying to figure out how human consciousness works. And you have to start thinking about the brain and not just the mind, because there's a relationship there. Yes. It's a, you know old so, Cartesian mind-body problem is really where my heart started to go a flutter. And <laughs> I realized that I can keep studying the mind and I can keep, you know, reading all the books and and sitting in a dusty old armchair and thinking, but at the end of the day, what I'm actually trying to understand is what's inside of me, which is biology. You can't divorce them. 
So understanding the science of the brain was a way for you to separate out what the brain's responsible for and how much it plays a role in consciousness? Well, that's the attempt, but the attempt. it turns out consciousness is exceedingly complicated and a difficult subject to traverse and even honestly define in the first place. But that is where I ended up in neuroscience and how I ended up there is in the pursuit of understanding myself and humankind, really. So what discoveries did you make along the way that led you to doing this now? Because you, you studied high performers and figured out how to m make people even optimize their neural connectivity is what I read in, in your bio. Well, I don't uh, know what that means, so I'm going to need you to... <laughs> we'll get there. We'll get okay. there. Um, I started out actually in psychopharmacology. Okay. So giving drugs to people and seeing what happens, really. <laughs> it's, a, it's, a, it's a fun space. That's what I did in high school. <laughs> We all do it recreationally. I did it in the lab. There, the goal is to optimize the human being, but also to understand what role different neurotransmitters and neurochemicals play in our performance and in our conscious experience. So studying psychopharmacology uh, and kind of coming at performance and performance enhancement from a pharma perspective was amazingly fascinating. Such an honor to be a part of that research. Mm -hmm. uh, during that process, during that research process, I myself, being a stressed out undergraduate, needed to find an outlet to sort of maintain my own mental health and performance. And I found meditation. And that became a huge part of my life and continues to be to this day. And from there, after seeing so many students literally come off of taking Adderall, change their lives, completely transform themselves in a matter of weeks without any pharmacological intervention, just with things that they're doing inside of their body, their mind. It's like, okay, there's something here. We can do non-invasive tech right now. We can mm -hmm. figure out ways to help people that are free and easy to do and easy to implement. You can do it anywhere. It scales, absolutely. You can have groups of people do it. You can have little kids do it. You can have older folks do it. Um, and that's where my wheels started turning and thinking about what ways we can train, what approaches we can take to life and to work that could optimize the human being biologically. Again, always housed within science, but it's something that everyone can do and adopt. And that's really the, the story of like my whole professional life is that's my only goal at this point is to help busy professionals be less busy, to have time and to have headspace and to focus and be more productive so they can all do their best work. Because I'm going to be honest with you, I'm not all that bright. <laughs> I'm making it work. I, I work hard. And that's, that's my secret is that I just work very, very hard. But I have had the honor of meeting so many amazingly brilliant, creative, smart people in my life. And if I can be the person and the expert that just helps them do their best work, then I can help the rest of you change the world. So I totally get what you're saying. It's like you can amplify your input by helping amazing people be extra amazing. And then you're changing the world from like your small corner of it. <laughs> from, the, from the background. Yeah. And sending them, sending them all out to do their best work. Are you a business professional with a story of innovation in technology, leadership, or design and ready to share that story with the world? Fast Company Press wants to hear from you. Fast Company Press, the official book publishing imprint of Fast Company Magazine, is turning the publishing industry on its head, and they're looking for business leaders who've done the same. To learn more about this world-class imprint or to discuss your story, book a free consultation with a member of the submissions team at fastcompanypress.com slash podcast. Here at 99U, you're teaching a workshop on how to stop draining your brain's resources, accelerate creativity, and get more done. What are the most common bad habits that we all need to kick that are responsible for brain drain? Distraction. Our brains are not wired to be constantly inundated with things like notifications. Our devices, our relationship with our devices really needs to change in order for us to gain control back of our attention and our headspace. Maybe this is my own soapbox, but I am constantly confused. Every single app wants to send me push notifications. And I am like, fuck no. I don't <laughs> want any more notifications. Good for you. Silicon Valley, though, needs to understand that like notifications are not 
the way. <laughs> That's not the way forward, guys. Figure out a better way. <laughs> I'm going to be honest with you. It's actually people like me that helped invent them in the first place to get you addicted to your apps. Oh. So I guess consider it my personal mission to undo things that my predecessors did before me. But Is yes, it they're there for like a reason. you or people with your knowledge using their superpowers for evil? Yes, it's that. It's my evil twins from the <laughs> yes. past. <laughs> <laughs> but it is truly that the notifications are there for business reasons and it's to get you addicted to the apps. Okay, so it's got to be having a backlash, but that distraction, is it doing permanent damage to our brains or is it just damaging our productivity in the moment? It's hard to tell. This technology is all new. To make a claim about long-term impact, I think we need more time, but I don't want more time. I want people to win back their attention now. I don't want it to, to wait until it gets worse for people to figure out and for, for researchers like myself to figure out what the long-term impact is. I would love to not see kids attached to their you know, iPads, their phones, and their Apple Watches and just getting buzzed and clicked and, and pinged every second of the day. So I have that problem too. I don't have kids who are distracted, but the notification comes in on my phone and then it vibrates on my wrist and I, my heart, I feel my heart rate go up and I know I'm having a physiological, biological response. And of course, I'm assuming the notification means I'm late or I did something wrong. How is that distraction impeding our performance and fragmenting our brains? Well, distraction pulls your attention away from whatever it is that you're supposed to be doing at the time. I'll actually, if you don't mind, I'll introduce a, a phenomenon that's it's quite easy to understand and I think very real for most of us these days, for anyone who does any kind of knowledge work that creates for a living. Mm -hmm. And that is a term that I still, to, much to my dismay, still see on LinkedIn profiles and job descriptions, and that is the word multitasking. We are not wired to multitask. That's, it's not a thing. Multitasking is not a thing. Instead, what we're doing every single time we attempt to do two things at once or to have our attention split mm -hmm. is we are task switching. We are context switching. And every single time we switch, we pay for it. There is a cost associated with every single switch. We pay for it with time and we pay for it with energy. And that's what's really fracturing our ability to do our best work. And to get into flow, to get into a state of deep work where we're actually producing and thinking creatively and problem solving and thinking strategically and also keeping low levels of stress the entire time. Task switching is really one of the easiest things to start addressing and to stop doing that can win back a lot of your attention. And you'll start to feel that mental fog Kind of drift away and you'll start to feel your own mind coming back to you. And that's that kind of work and that the feedback that I get when we train people on how to do what we call focus sprints, which is a methodology of work uh, that we've created and developed uh, and tested that allows not only individuals, but also teams to win back their focus, to monotask, to do one thing at a time intentionally during their best hours of the day, their peak performance hours, and to get their best work done and then feel good in the process and not burn out. When I do that kind of training and I hear people, you know, say up and down the totem pole that they feel like themselves again for the first time, that they can hear themselves think, that keeps That's me motivated. That's huge. I want that. Is there something I can do at home? Like a just stop trying to multitask, just do one thing at a time? Is it as simple as that? Or is it, when you talk about the training for the focus sprints, is it more involved? It's simple to do. Mm -hmm. um, it might, we might probably don't have the time to, to go into it now, but the bare bones of it and the intentionality behind it is really to carve out blocks of time when you're at your best mentally and physically. So know when you're at your best, mm -hmm. first and foremost, and try to protect that time. Block it off intentionally so that folks don't have the expectation that you're going to be available and open for interruption. Right. <laughs> right. Close out the email inbox. I know it might be scary in the beginning, but close it out. Hopefully the notifications are already turned off. Put the cell phone away. Embrace, do not disturb. <laughs> Embrace airplane mode. Put it away. Even if in the beginning all you can manage to do is 15 minutes, 20 minutes, 30 minutes, start small. 
and continue, but really block off that intentional time and try to do one thing intentionally. What do you aim to accomplish at the end of that time period? And then just set a timer and go. Thank you for that. For a really hardcore multitasker, which I'm not, I'm a monotasker. I've never been good at multitasking, Love but that. I know people who are good at it. For hardcore multitaskers, is that a habit they have to kick? Like, is that something they have to actively rewire their brain if they're used to dividing their focus like that? Well, I would never want to prescribe anyone to do anything they wouldn't normally want to do. So they don't have to do. No one has to no, do anything. No, However, but I mean, yeah. like, is it a habit, the multitasking? Is it, it it's hard? It's now like carved its neural pathways in their brain or? Well, it depends how long they've done it. You know, okay. Every, every habit lives in the brain. It mm. lives behaviorally within us. And if you want to rewire it or redesign really your present day behaviors, then there's a there's a process for that as well. But absolutely, it's totally something you can redo and redesign. You can totally train yourself to not be a quote unquote multitasker. Okay. <laughs> I always put it in quotes though, because it's, it's not a task suboptimal switcher? for sure. If you're a great <laughs> task switcher, yeah. <laughs> Is the advice the same for creativity, focus, and productivity, or are there key differences? Well, there's one, I would say, key difference between, I would put focus and productivity in one camp. Okay. And then I would put creativity many times in a slightly different camp. If you're in that process of looking for inspiration and that's your job, you're mm -hmm. looking for that solution, you're looking for that aha moment, many times you need to oscillate between thinking about the problem and then walking away. Mm, mm -hmm. And coming back to it and walking away. You've ever you know, heard of those uh, amazing stories of folks coming up with solutions in the shower, that sort of thing. Every environment we're in as individuals, every environment we're in triggers or can trigger certain brain states. Yes. It can trigger certain emotions, certain thought patterns and thought loops. So if you find yourself as a creative looking for that aha moment, looking for that inspiration, that creative insight, and you find yourself up against a wall and you keep hitting your head against that wall and you're not coming up with a solution, walk away. Walk away and expose yourself to a new environment. Drink a cold glass of water. Drink some hot water. Expose yourself to different stimuli. See what else you can introduce to your system to trigger different thought patterns, different thought loops. Just jigger the electrical system above your neck and see if that jiggering can actually inspire some creative solution that's just been sitting there this whole time. It just needed a little bit of finagling to get. You're saying sort of work out the kinks of your brain, like jostle it a little bit so that it can get from one state to another and then back and forth to loose, loosen something up so it can flow to the surface? Or are you like rebooting the computer? It absolutely can feel like rebooting the computer. What I'm saying is that for creatives, it can feel like sometimes, and it, what it looks like sometimes in the brain is that you're stuck in a certain brain state. Mm. And just like if your computer were frozen you would just press the on off switch and just reboot the whole damn thing and just start from scratch or do something different. That also is super helpful. Go out and take a walk. Yes. Uh, so expose the image, yourself to a new environment. The image just came to mind of like you go to your hotel room and you try the key and it doesn't open the door. You try the key and it doesn't open the door. You try the key and it doesn't open the door. So you take a step back and you look at the key and you're trying to open the wrong door. <laughs> <laughs> yes. But you had to remove yourself from that situation to see the problem from a more macro view. Yeah, taking a step back, okay. trying something different. What is the main advice you have just for general self-care for your brain? Something that can help us keep our brains fit and healthy for the length of our whole lives. What should we start doing ASAP? Sleep. Really? Yeah, you got to rest. Every piece of advice I were to ever give any high-performing, high-achieving, amazing human being on the face of this planet is a moot point if we are not sleeping. Why is this culture so proud of not sleeping? Being so busy and not sleeping. I want to be less busy and more well-rested. I love that. You've got great <laughs> habits. Well, I'm trying to get to that consciousness thing. Yeah. <laughs> How important is meditation for brain health? Many studies, a lot of research to back a lot of really positive health benefits of meditation, absolutely. And meditation can do a wide variety of things. The first, and as a productivity researcher, uh, for me, a hugely important one, is that it can 
hone attention. It can actually help you pay attention for longer periods of time in your life. So if you want to get better at getting into flow, you want to become more productive, you want it to be easier to tune out distraction in the first place, Mm -hmm. then meditation or attention training is absolutely one of the easiest and free ways to do it anytime, anywhere for anyone. I love it. It also helps with stress, which is an added benefit. Yes, a huge (laughs) added benefit. Well, stress is a source of almost all of our ailments, right? It's not helpful. No, true. <laughs> some some level know of stress you... is, of course, helpful, but we usually have a lot of it. Anxiety is not helpful. Well, so that was going to be my next question. Do you have any tips for anxiety is a whole big can of worms, but let's say it's low-grade anxiety and you need to be creative on a deadline. Do you have any tips for help? Is it take a step back or how do you work through anxiety or emotional distress, or if your life is falling apart, but work has to stay on track, what do you do there? Ooh, there's a, this is a can of worms. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> Sorry, can you just tell us the answer to life in, one, <laughs> in a half an hour podcast, please? I'm still working out like a lot of those answers myself. Well, okay. If you're anxious because life is mm-hmm. happening, then you have to just accept that it's happening and breathe through it. I mean, breathing, I think, is the easiest thing that anyone can ever do and sometimes the hardest thing that we forget to do when we're anxious. But just breathing and staying in your body, there's a lot of different stress management and anxiety management techniques out there. But when work needs to happen and you find your head spinning and emotions stirring, then finding a time and a place to deal with them and acknowledge them that's intentional is a really great way to convince your brain that you're going to come back to it. Say, you know what? Right now, I have to do this thing. But we will deal with this anxiety. We will deal with the thing that's stressing me out. Let's say, let's pencil it in on the calendar. 3 to 4 p.m. on Wednesday, I'm going to deal. I'm going to sit down. I'm going to deal with these emotions. And once that's there in the calendar, it can help quell a lot of that anxiety up front because you know that you're going to deal with it. There will be a time and a place intentionally for you to deal with it and then breathe through the rest of it. That makes a lot of sense. Don't just stuff it down because then it's going to have to keep making noise in order to get you to deal with it. Mm -hmm. But if you say, hey, we're going to talk this out after I get this meeting out of the way. (laughs) Absolutely. Then it can be like, okay, all right, then what can I do to help you get that meeting out of the way? (laughs) Exactly. So in all of this pursuit of high performance, it seems like the goals could be churn out more genius work, do more of it in a day, make more money, convince other people to spend more money. You already touched a little bit on the dark side of neuroscience, those people convincing the app developers how they could get people's attention and keep them on their app for longer, get more of their attention. Attention pirates. That's what I just labeled them. (laughs) Attention Uh. piratry. I've never heard of that before, but I love it. I love it. I just made it up. If that's the evil side, what's the good side? And is this pursuit of high performance potentially sidelining other things like kindness and compassion and consciousness, or is it helping? I can tell you my, my personal mission. Please. As I said, People have a lot of work to do, and they have a lot of goals in their lives, both Mm -hmm. professional and personal. I want to help people finish their work as quickly as possible, as painlessly as possible by leveraging their biology and not fighting their biology so they can get their work done and, drum roll please, (laughs) go home. Oh, I want my friends back. (laughs) Yeah, I want my family back. I don't want them busy all the time. I want people to get their work done because right now the status quo is we are inundated with meetings and calls and emails and Slack notifications and all kinds of things all day, all day, every day. And what ends up happening is most people I know, most ambitious professionals I know, especially creatives, end up taking their work home. The work day doesn't exist anymore. They're just communicating all day and reactive all day. It's not a time anymore. It's not a sacred time anymore for them to sit down and be creative and strategic and to do the good work, the work that they have to do, that they've been hired to do. So they have no choice. They take it home. They take it on the weekends. And then they have no life. And they're not resting. And then they're not sleeping. 
And that's when I'm pissed again. Yes. <laughs> so and I'm trying to get people to get their work done and then leave the office. Go have a life, rest, recover, and then come back. And it sounds like if you rest and recover, have a life, have joy, have downtime, and are well-rested, that also probably helps you be more productive, but also a kinder person and one who can more easily train your values on the helping the world. <laughs> absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. Actually, right before this interview, mm -hmm. um, I was outside grabbing a drink and one of the other attendees came up to me and she was in one of the talks and told me the story about how she ended up yelling at someone in her office because she was so sleep deprived. They were up on a deadline. She just lost it and ended up yelling at someone and snapping at them. And at, that was the breaking point for her. And she said, you know what, guys, I need to take a nap right here in the damn office. She just laid down on a couch and took a nap. And then she got up afterwards and felt like an entirely different version of herself. And her colleagues were like, you just, you look different. You're like glowing now. It's like, yeah, who would have thunk it? I got a rest. Yeah. So absolutely, of course it helps us be kinder and more compassionate and bring our, our best human selves to work. Amen. <laughs> Thank you so much for sharing all of your wisdom with us. Before we let you go, will you tell us uh, your website and your social media handles? We won't turn our notifications on, but we will. <laughs> when we're in that space, we'll want to look up your work and see what you're doing. Sure. I don't have any social media handles, however. Oh, good for you. Yeah, I, have a, I have a tendency to practice what I preach. But, of course, you can uh, find my information, my personal information at saharayusef.com. But more importantly, my personal Mission in life, you can find at stoa.partners. That's spelled S-T-O-A dot partners. And that is my consultancy and firm um, that my team and I have together. And that's where we're trying to fix the world and fix work as we know it so that folks can go home and rest and go to sleep. <laughs> where did all of this work in neuroscience and philosophy lead you to on the consciousness trail? I'm still working on it. That's yeah. it, right? That's lifelong. Yeah. Yeah. Still working on it. Well, thank you so much. Thanks, everyone, for listening. To learn more about Dr. Yusuf's work and read the show notes, click the link in the details of this episode on your podcast app or go to cleverpodcast.com where you can also sign up for our newsletter. You can also subscribe to Clever on Apple Podcasts or wherever you get your podcasts. And we would love it if you would rate or review us on iTunes. It really helps make a difference. We also love it if you reach out to us on Twitter, Instagram, and Facebook. It's really fun to chat with you about what you found interesting about the show or just to learn a little bit more about who's listening. You can find us at Clever Podcast. Clever is created, hosted, and produced by us, Amy Devers and Jamie Derringer, also known as 2VDE Media, with editing by Rich Straffolino and music by L1011. Clever is proudly distributed by Design Milk.